It is wonderful to see the bookstore absolutely packed out. What a joy uh, to have you all here. Uh, I feel honestly like a dunce sitting between Dr. Moeller and Dr. George. Uh, if I could have any tag team for a debate, it would be these two. Uh, and so sadly, we only have one hour uh, for this conversation because we could sit here for a much, much longer period of time to discuss a lot of weighty issues that need to be discussed. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, you two have had a, a long history. Uh, I was just curious, maybe for the the crowd here, tell us where you all have first met and interacted and kind of where your careers have just kind of intersected. First of all, it's a great honor to be with you both. And it's a tremendous honor to have Robbie George here on the campus. And uh, thank you for that brilliant lecture. Uh, lots to talk about there. Uh, I first knew of uh, Robbie George, and I've never told him this, uh, through a controversy. And I had no idea who he was, but I did know who Martha Nussbaum was. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was a kid. Uh, well, I was one, too. And, uh, but... but uh, I, I came across an article in a, a, a magazine entitled uh, Lingua Franca, and I decided you were a great guy <laughs> just based upon your engagement with Martha Nussbaum. And then uh, I uh, spoke for an organization and a magazine known as Touchstone yeah, at, uh, in, in the Chicago area in Mundelein. And uh, Dr. George and I shared uh, the event and, uh, as I recall, shared a, a car ride to the airport. And uh, I grew to know that he is in person even better than he is in print. And that's really saying something. Well, uh, Al, I want to say what an honor it is to be back at Southern and to be here with you. And thanks for doing this uh, part of the program uh, uh, with us. I see that uh, President Moeller has taken my advice and uh, is doing what I do, dyeing his hair gray to get the respect of his students. And it, I, I hope it's working. I hope it's working with you kids. Uh, I'm really stunned to hear Dr. Mueller tell the uh, Martha Nussbaum story, so I guess I have to tell the rest of the story. Please. Um, so I was uh, still very young, starting out assistant professor, tenure track but untenured uh, at Princeton, uh, where I was, oh, how do I put this, maybe a bit out of step with most of my peers and most of my senior colleagues who would be voting on my tenure case. Uh, but uh, since I have had since uh, childhood a lot of difficulty behaving myself, uh, I said yes when asked by the Attorney General of Colorado to be an expert witness for the state of Colorado defending its constitutional amendment, Amendment 8, state constitutional amendment, which overturned the gay rights ordinances in Denver and Boulder, which had added the concept of sexual orientation, about which I am very dubious, uh, to the standard civil rights statutes, uh, civil rights ordinances for the, for the city. Uh, this, as my supporters um, uh, at the time on campus and my advisors advised me for an untenured professor, was suicidal. <laughs> um, but I did it anyway, uh, because I can't behave myself. The other side, uh, the great tennis player Martina Navratilova and the other people who were challenging the amendment, retained as their expert witness on moral philosophy and civil rights, Martha Nussbaum, who was not an obscure assistant professor, but was a already a uh, leading figure, a, a towering figure in the field of, uh, of uh, philosophy. So um, the two of us were opponents, you know, we were on opposite sides as witnesses for our respective parties, uh, on questions of homosexual conduct and, uh, and uh, relationships. And uh, she showed up uh, and, uh, in the courtroom in, in Denver. I, we were not there together in the courtroom, but she showed up for her time. And, and she was uh, welcomed by the glitterati of uh, Boulder as a conquering hero. Uh, I did not receive such a welcome <laughs> from the glitterati. Um, but, uh, is this being filmed? I'm yeah. sure it is. Okay, good. So get this on the film. She <laughs> lied and perjured herself on the, uh, on the witness stand. Um, 
uh, making claims that were just absolutely indefensible, incompatible with uh, what was uh, known uh, in the scholarship about uh, the, schol the philosophers of classical antiquity, for example, and their beliefs about uh, homosexual conduct and uh, relationships, uh, misrepresenting even her own uh, scholarship. And so I said so. And uh, you can imagine uh, what the cataclysmic <laughs> reaction of all that was. And it became, I mean, I was nobody. I was just an obscure assistant professor at tenure. But it became a national issue. And suddenly there were articles about it, including uh, in, the, uh, in the journal uh, Lingua Franca. And in that particular article, uh, the author who was uh, himself involved in the gay uh, movement and was sympathetic to her general position, to his very great credit, a very honorable person, told the truth about what had gone on between her and me and about the sources and, and, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, I now see what you read that uh, prompted you to be interested in what I was doing. I, I consider myself at the moment one of the most successful pyromaniacs uh, because I just put out a spark and there it went. So thank you for that. That way it, was, it was worth this event just to hear that recitation <laughs> of that controversy. I, I enjoyed that spectacularly. Now she had actually, I just finished the story saying she had argued that there was no great philosopher of antiquity and no great Mediterranean civilization in which either the philosopher or the civilization had any moral qualms about homosexual conduct and relationships. Spectacularly false. And a leading classical philosophy scholar saying this thing in order to defend this, uh, this statute. I mean, the argument that the, that the Martina Navratilova side was making was that um, the Colorado Amendment 8 was a pure imposition of Christian theology because uh, moral criticism of homosexual conduct and relationships uh, was unknown before Christianity, and Christianity came in with this idiosyncratic view and then imposes it uh, in, the, in the cultures in which it gains ascendancy. You know, again, spectacularly false. As I was telling you, um, on Reformation Day, our good friend Ryan Anderson uh, doesn't always like to celebrate Reformation Day. <laughs> and sometimes he'll go off on uh, Martin Luther. And I usually get I'm known as kind of the, um, the Protestant whisperer for Ryan Anderson. And so people will be asking me, why is Ryan up in arms over Reformation Day? And I'll say, well, he's a staunch Catholic. And uh, then, then I'll, I'll necessarily text Ryan and I'll say, Ryan, hey, man, I know this is, not, this is not your day, October 31st every single year. I said, but do keep in mind. Uh, I think more Southern Baptists and more evangelicals might purchase your books than even Roman Catholics. So I said, you might be costing yourself some book sales here, man. So this raises a question of Southern Baptists and evangelicals really relate and buy into the types of arguments that you and Ryan make. I'm just curious, like, why do you think there's a resonance in, I mean, you're at, a, you're at the largest evangelical seminary right here. Um, you're a Roman Catholic uh, philosopher. Why is there such resonance in your arguments with this crowd? Well, I opened my sorry. Uh, I opened my remarks upstairs by telling the story of doing the Norton lectures at roughly the same time in the same time span that I was giving the uh, Dewey lecture at at Harvard. And and what I said was true. I was I was treated very well. I was welcomed there as a as an honored guest. I had was an alumnus of Harvard uh, Law School, but. Uh, the difference between the two was when I was here at Southern to give the Norton Lectures, I really felt I was among my people. I, I was a visitor at Harvard. I was among my people at, at, at Southern. You know, so there are these important theological differences between Protestants and Catholics, but the kinds of issues that we're concerned about today, the kinds of things we talked about today, there are no differences. Uh, uh, we need to learn as much from each other. And I think the engagement of Protestants and Catholics, especially evangelical Protestants, I, these days, I'm, I'm tempted to say exclusively evangelical Protestants because of the way the main line has gone uh, off the deep end, but certainly largely evangelical Protestants. The engagement has been edifying for both sides. I think a lot of Protestants who um, would otherwise not see the value or point of 
philosophical work and philosophical arguments in defense of marriage and the family, sanctity of human life, religious freedom, and the rights of conscience, do see them in part because of the work of Catholic thinkers. I hope I've contributed a little to that, Ryan Anderson and others. Catholics who would otherwise, if they owned a Bible at all, have that Bible you know, in dad's den, tucked away and unopened for 10 years at a time, are reading their Bibles and understanding them and understanding the importance of the Bible in their personal lives, in their spiritual lives, as a result of the influence of evangelical uh, Protestantism. So whatever the differences are, and they're important, I get all that, but whatever the differences are, there's been a profound gift given to us sometimes hard won. I mean, we probably wouldn't be doing what we're doing together were it not for the terrible thing that the Supreme Court did in 1973, exposing unborn babies to the lethal violence of abortion. But God, who brings good out of evil every single time, has brought together Catholics and evangelicals, and we're learning from each other, and we're building each other up, and we're encouraging other, each other, and we're edifying each other. And I don't want that to be lost. I don't want those wings of Catholicism and evangelicalism that would destroy this, it's not just an alliance, this spiritual brotherhood. I don't want them to win. I want them to remain fringe. Now, I want this to be a, a conversation, so I'd love for you to add to that and kind of expand. I'm kind of going to have to. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate the graciousness of uh, Professor George's uh, comment there, and I, I, I want to compliment and, and then contrast a bit. Uh, at that conference where I think we were first together uh, in person, and that must be 20 plus years ago. Um, I was invited, I think, because I was a very clear confessional Protestant. And uh, the organizers, I think, wanted someone who was a very clear confessional Protestant uh, to respond. And I did. And, and folks are very gracious. Um, but I just tried to set the stage for how I understood it then. And I, I, I saw that address not long ago. And I went back and said, I'm glad to say I still agree with it. Um, we are in a, first of all, a completely changed intellectual context. So if you were to go back, uh, let, let, let's say 100 years, because that's going to be very convenient for my argument. If you go back 100 years, uh, there was absolutely no question that Protestant evangelicals and Roman Catholics, if you considered a Venn diagram, um, both made claim upon the great body of Christian theism and um, and this deposit of the faith that included the apostles and 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 so even the reformers themselves in the 16th century were at pains to say we're not we're not foregoing that tradition we're claiming it where we differ we differ with deep significance and this is a this is a difference even in how we differ so I'm always frustrated with my conservative Catholic friends because they never believe I disagree as much as I disagree. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I've just kind of grown to understand that. And that is because the doctrinal and theological uh, impetus behind Protestantism, it really does meet a very different theological logic. And, uh, and, and this one, I mean, I'm just thankful there's so many gracious Roman Catholics to kind of withstand our arguments. Um, but I, I want to say that if you went 100 years ago, when things began to crack apart, then, as I said, drawing attention this morning in chapel and convocation, this is, this month, the 100th anniversary of Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. And that was the great Protestant Orthodox declaration that the world was breaking apart. And as he said, Christianity and liberalism are not two forms of one religion. They're two different religions. And Machen, who was the staunch confessional Presbyterian of old Princeton, you know, came out and said, this is not analogous to Protestant relationships to Roman Catholicism. You know, what, what the liberals are denying is every bit of historic Christianity, uh, something that the Roman Catholic Church does not do <laughs> and confessional Protestants do not do. And so... You know, I I would be very glad to have at some point uh, the right debate and argument over justification. But it's not that that has gone away. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, this is the other conservative quandary is that 
what liberals take away, they take away comprehensively. And so, in other words, to talk about any doctrine these days is, uh, is first of all, to run into conflict with those who are anti-doctrinal. But the change situation is such right now to compare, as I did this morning, 1923 with 2023. I'll tell you what, Harry Merson Fosdick and the, the most uh, arduous liberals and ardent theological revisionists, they had a pretty good idea what marriage was. Uh, they were absolutely unconfused about bathrooms. And uh, if you look at the, and, and, and actually one of the sad things is, is the Protestant liberals and some of the Catholic modernists as well, but the, Catholic, the, the Protestant liberals claim to be saving Christian morality from Christian theology. And of course, this is where we understand you, you crash them both. And inevitably this happens. But here's where I want to speak in particular of an indebtedness. So if you go back to the 16th century, and this is clear in both Calvin and Luther, just for an example. Both of them affirm the natural law. Now, they do not do so in language that uh, Thomas Aquinas might greatly appreciate. But nonetheless, I think he would understand. For Luther, it was creation order. Uh, and uh, for Calvin, uh, it, was, it was very much the revelation in nature, in the law. And so you could even say natural law. But look, so long as everybody agreed on what marriage was, and so long as the great titanic moral battles concerning the dignity and sanctity of life were not raging in the culture, here's the thing. For about 400 years, there is almost no significant Protestant cognition on a lot of these issues. Now, thankfully, that's not comprehensively so, and I would say it's one of the reasons why a figure like Hermann Bavink uh, looms so much larger on our theological conversation these days, because thankfully he and many others actually did. But in the main, it's just not there. So the great uh, moral crises of the last half of the 20th century related to the sanctity of life, the gender, sexuality, evangelicals showed up with pamphlets, and the Catholics showed up with libraries. And uh, and it is because they have been working in the trenches for a very long time on these issues. And to be honest, evangelical and confessional Protestants found that we had to develop arguments very fast. Now, the, again, it's a Venn diagram. The arguments are not 100% the same. But on those issues, they are <laughs> at any distance 100% the same. Uh, I think even in the Q&A period with Dr. George, it was really interesting, especially at the end. Um, where some of those, where the Venn diagram would differ, it started to show right there at the end of the Q&A, which I wish could have gone on forever. Um, but that, that it's not insignificant. But the fact is, and I'm saying this as a word of gratitude, I hope it's heard that way, that if it had not been for serious Roman Catholic theologians, philosophers, and, and scholars working hard at this for 400 years, uh, and I mean when, when Protestantism was basically not dealing with these issues, uh, then w we would be in, in much worse shape than we are. And so it was a rediscovery. And, and I mean, a lot of it was just personal. You know, it, w when my mother, as an early pro-life activist, uh, as an early activist, uh, you know, when she went down to do pro-life work, she was with a few evangelicals and a lot of Catholics. And you know what? That changed the entire context of conversation. And frankly, opened uh, an entire avenue of uh, of understanding. And so, for for an evangelical, for the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, we are proud to be co belligerents. But it's more than that. We are proud to be co thinkers. But as I said, and I go back to when we first met in person, uh, I'm only of value to this if I show up as everything I am. And so, I will say, not only a confessing Protestant, but I'll utter the word, a Baptist. <laughs> and it really matters to me that in conversation, I can understand Robbie George as a Catholic thinker and a Catholic man. And uh, we would both, I am sure, like to persuade one another of many things. But I am persuaded that he is a great gift. Um, and uh, I, I received that friendship and, and with many other Catholic thinkers as a, a gift as well. So you are both regarded as public intellectuals, but to, to make that more narrow and specific, you're regarded as um, conservative. 
public intellectuals. Uh, we are living downstream from 2016 when the bomb went off and uh, rethinking conservative realignments and what conservatism means today. Uh, I think it would be really helpful for this audience uh, if we could get both of you to offer a definition of what you think conservatism means. Well, let's first talk about what it doesn't mean, at least if we're talking about American conservatism. Um, now, I think there are some uh, commonalities between American and European conservatism, but there are also very important differences. And those differences used to be merely theoretically important, and today they are no longer merely theoretically important. They are practical in the sense that I used in the lecture, Aristotle's sense. They are genuine practical differences. European conservatism is, for the most part, historically has been, blood and soil and throne and altar conservatism. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. When I say European conservatism has largely been blood and soil conservatism, that is not to accuse all European conservatives or the majority of European conservatives or anything more than a small minority of, unfortunately, very influential at one time, European conservative intellectuals of being Nazis. They're not. But their understanding of what nations are built on and integrated around and what their unity is based on is essentially a common land, a common ethnicity, a common religion, throne and altar, a common uh, history, a common uh, uh, set of experiences. Um. That's the idea of the, that's the European idea of a nation, and what we conserve are the principles around which we integrate ourselves and form our unity as a, as a people. American conservatism was never that. It was not blood and soil, never was blood and soil or throne and altar conservatism. What it was was the conservatism of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which Lincoln himself, four score and seven years roughly later, uh, affirms as conservatism. Lincoln says we Republicans are conservatives because we're conserving the principles of the American founding. Now, in a certain sense, it's true to say that those principles are principles of a certain sort of, please don't misunderstand me, I'm modifying, certain sort of liberalism, Madisonian Tocquevillian liberalism. So we American conservatives, unlike our British fourth cousins or our continental fifth cousins, are old-fashioned liberals. We conservatives, American conservatives, really old-fashioned Madisonian Tocquevillian liberals. We also believe, and here again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I, there, there are nuances. This is not meant to be uh, uh, taken without context. We are believers in the idea of a creedal nation that our unity is not built around blood and soil or thrown in also common culture, common race, cult, common ethnicity, anything like that. It's built around a shared commitment to the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution, which is why anybody can become, in the fullest and richest sense, an American. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your national history is, your ethnicity. It doesn't matter what your religion is. If you come lawfully... <laughs> You become a citizen, you're willing to share the burdens of citizenship, fulfill its responsibilities, and you sign on to the creed. We make our immigrants actually swear allegiance to the creed. You can become not just an American citizen, you can become an American, as an American as the guy whose ancestors came on the Mayflower. Try trying to try, see, it, see how it works if you try to become Japanese, or for that matter, even French. You know, you can become a French citizen if you're not French. It's really hard to become a Frenchman. That's, that's still a big issue there. And I like our creedal. Again, now, I don't want to overemphasize this. It's got to be understood in context. There are nuances. I like our idea of creedal nationalism, that we're a creedal nation, because I like the principles of the creed. I think it is true that all men are created equal, that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if we understand happiness correct, correctly, with its moral inflection. 
I do believe that central among the, go- the pr- purposes for which governments have their justification is the protection of, of rights. I agree with all that. Now, I say that I want the nuances there, too, and I don't want to be misunderstood, because I recognize, as, say, my former student, Yoram Hazani, would very, very quick to point out, as people today who regard themselves as national conservatives or nationalist conservatives would point out, it is true what they say, that you need more than just the creed. You do need a culture. So my nuance, though, is, yeah, but the culture's got to be consistent with the creed, and the culture has, to a considerable extent, be the product of the creed and grow out of the creed. And I think that's true. That's why we Americans are we're Protestant and Catholic. We're Christian and Jewish and atheist. We are uh, Buddhist. We are Japanese uh, ancestry, uh, German ancestry, Russian ancestry, Polish ancestry, Nigerian ancestry, Indian, con- subcontinent Indian an- ancestry. And, so, and we can all be Americans. and We can be Americans together. And I hate to lose that. And there was once a time when the attack on American exceptionalism, the idea of a creedal nation, the idea that we're different from blood and soil nations, whether the European nations or a nation like Japan, there was a time not long ago in, in our memories when the attacks on that came exclusively from the left. Today they're coming from the right as well. And that worries me. So when you ask me to define conservatism, I want to stick to traditional American conservatism. Even if that's the old-fashioned liberalism of of Madison and Tocqueville, I want to conserve the principles of the American founding and the principles of the Constitution because that's the source of our unity. And I think it's also the source of our greatness if we want to get into a discussion of what really would make America great. What would make America great is living up to our constitutional principles and ideals and having our constitutional constitutional institutions function in the way they do, which is why I created and run the center that I do at Princeton, which is the James Madison program in American ideals and institutions. I believe in them. So that's what I, where I think our conservatism should be. So the political philosopher answers conservatism that way. The theologian defines conservatism how? Well, I'm going to begin with speaking of modern conservatism in much the same place. As a matter of fact, I contrast it with blood and soil, throne and altar. I do want to suggest that those two couplings are more problematic in a continental context than in an English-speaking context. And so I'm a bit intentionally Berkey in here. Uh, I, I, I do want to say that our British cousins and our uh, Hungarian cousins are not in the same place. Uh, we can learn from both, but they're, they're just not in the same place. And we are the product of that English-speaking conservative tradition, which, again, you could speak of as classical liberty. Um, I I, want to say that I think one of the most crucial distinctions we need to make these days is uh, between the right and conservatism. Because conservatism's on the right, but there are people on the right who are by no means conservative. They're, They're way past conservative. Or they, frankly, are just against the left. Uh, and so you can be on the right just by wanting to blow up the left. That does not make you a conservative. A conservative believes in the permanent things and in first principles. And a conservative believes in uh, in obviously conserving. But what's what 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 is what is our attempt to conserve? Well, those things that are necessary for human dignity and human flourishing. Um, and and so I also will affirm America is a creedal nation, but I'll just simply have to say that makes more sense and and makes, by contrast, less sense when you go from a shared worldview in which that creed was articulated to one in which now uh, that creed is by no means a consensus statement for many. I also would have to interject what uh, I, I think our constitutional founders would have similarly insisted upon this missing from the conversation, and that is that this creedal affirmation and citizenship must be understood as uh, inextricably linked. And I think Robbie kind of mentioned that with uh, requiring new citizens uh, to adopt the creed, but that's given without any definition or dictionary. And, uh, and we have wild disagreement about what that creed actually means now. And I find that untenable. I think the, the, the compelling power of an argument like that from your own Mazzoni, uh is that, all that makes sense if indeed there is a creed, but if they're merely words, uh, then that creed is not there. So I, I will say 
conservatives believe in conserving by appropriate, authentic means, and that begins organically, pre-politically, uh, but then also politically, what must be conserved for human dignity, human liberty, and human flourishing uh, to be uh, to be fostered. I can't resist telling another story. I, I know Al will appreciate this. I, I mentioned and told a story in uh, uh, Andrew's class earlier, uh, the late and very great Midge Dector. You remember Midge? I don't know if you knew her, uh, but she was a dear friend of uh, mine, a uh, Jewish lady involved with the Richard Newhouse and the uh, Institute on Religion and Public Life and First Things magazine. She wrote a very important book in the 60s. She was very prescient. She 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 understood that liberal parents don't produce liberal children. Liberal parents produce radical children. And she has been entirely 100% vindicated uh, on this. Anyway, she was a great lady, and I'll tell another story about, about her. Uh, she was giving the Erasmus Lecture of the Institute uh, back in the early 2000s, and she gave a wonderful talk. And uh, there was a young man, he must have been about 30 years old, uh, in the audience and turned to Q&A and he got the microphone first and he said, oh, Miss Dector, that was such a wonderful talk. Um, you know, I've really come to be a strong conservative, but you know, when I was in college, I wasn't, I was a liberal. I just believed all this liberal stuff. But then, you know, I graduated and I had to get a job and I got a paycheck and I saw how much the government was taken out of my, out of my pay and man, that really made me a conservative. So, so how do we get these young people to see it, you know, before they're getting the paychecks and stuff, you know, to, to see that they're being led down the wrong road in college. These professors are really filling their heads with bad ideas. And, you know, you really need to be a conservative. <laughs> and Mitch looked at him and she said, young man, someone who becomes conservative for money is not a conservative. <laughs> He's merely a Republican. <laughs> well, and just to continue, as we speak about conservatism, uh, Mitch Dector, Irving Kristol, uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb, you could get on the list, uh, often called neoconservatives. And, and we could discuss neoconservatism as an entire conversation. We won't today. But, as uh, I believe as Irving Kristol said, you know, it was being mugged by reality. A neoconservative, he says, one who's been mugged by reality. And it was really interesting to see how those neoconservatives turn to an immediate cultural concern. Now, my problem with the neoconservatives on the cultural issues was that they didn't have an ontology. Um, it was so, in other words, when we, that, that's what we're talking about, right? The natural law, creation order. We're talking about ontology. They largely forfeited ontology, and everything then becomes binding tradition. And the problem is when the tradition isn't binding, if you don't have ontology, you have no, nowhere to rebuild a house. But it, it was amazing how penetrating their criticisms of weak conservatism, uh, how, how trenchant those criticisms were. Yeah. Uh, Irving, Irving Crystal <laughs> had another definite in addition to his definition that a lib of a of a conservative as um, a liberal who's been mugged by reality his other definition was a conservative is a liberal with a 16 year old daughter there you go i like it i also understand that it and i didn't hear him say this but i i heard him ask, what is a what is a neoliberal and he said uh, it's a liberal who's been mugged by a neoconservative <laughs> <laughs> not it didn't go far enough um, I want to turn to the subject of institutions, building institutions. Uh, you're coming up on 30 years as president of Southern Seminary. You said today you've been at Princeton 38 years. In my 38th year. Um, you have started um, the Madison program. You're building Madison-like programs at other institutions all across the country. 22 of them at 22, 14 universities. Causing all of the right types of problems. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if this is a question. I want you to respond. Uh, or why do institutions matter like they do? Why is it important to anchor down and stay rooted in institutions? Why build institutions? And, and while you're thinking, um, you and I have had this conversation a lot. Uh, and, and I'm also thinking here about the fact that you've mentioned how Roman Catholicism has an inherent uh, uh, move towards tra 
towards institutionalism because it's been around for so long. And that manifests itself in the fact that depending on how you score Neil Gorsuch, five out of the six Supreme Court justices who are conservatives are, are, uh, are Catholics. So there's, there's, a, there's an institutional architecture that has helped produce a bunch of jurists, but none of them are Protestants. So there's institutions at play there. Um, I know this is, this is kind of all over the place, but just talk to us about institutions from both of your perspectives. Well, I'm going to have to begin as a, as a theologian and say that, uh, that you cannot have a biblical theology without an understanding of institutions. And God created institutions. They're, they're not merely human creations. Uh, God established at least three institutions absolutely essential for human flourishing. It begins with marriage and the family, and, and then government, and, and then the ecclesia, actually, the church itself. And, and so there are other institutions, but you can't have a biblical theology without the affirmation of institutions. And I think this is at least a part of the creation dominion mandate. Um, it can't be done without institutions. Now, here's where, and, and just by the way, historically, the Catholic Church not only is an institution, but Western civilization can't be explained without uh, the institutional contribution uh, of Roman Catholicism and of Christianity, um, uh, which, which would include also the Reformation churches. But in, in institutional life, what we have is a difference here. And so we go back to blood and soil thrown an altar. Uh, a part of what makes the English-speaking tradition very different is the freedom to institutionalize. And uh, the freedom to institutionalize means the freedom to take advantage of what uh, others might not be granted the privilege of in other societies. Uh, even today, you can think of many other societies, whether they be Marxist or or, uh, or Muslim, frankly, where you would have no institutional rights whatsoever. But the right to institutionalize your, your vision, your values, your doctrine, your, um, your, your educational purpose, uh, th then that, that, is, that is very much uh, a, uh, a central part of, I think, first of all, just a, a biblical understanding, but also a conservative understanding. Because here, here's the sad reality. Uh, conservatives build institutions and, and liberals ruin them. But it, it reaches a point where the conservatives devalue the institutions and the liberals value them, uh, if only to destroy them, uh, but also just to take them over, to, to take advantage of their institutional assets. And uh, the, the, even the name and brand and reputation is one of those institutional assets. So uh, all that to say that uh, you know, uh, conservatives understand two things and sin is absolutely necessary to understanding what, what explains these two things. The first thing is uh, institutions are not mere human inventions, and they're absolutely indispensable. And the second thing is uh, they are as affected by human fallenness and sinfulness as anything else. And so where you have institutions, you have an even more difficult job of maintaining a commitment to truth, a commitment to Christ, a commitment to the church. Uh, but we're, we are sitting in a context which is only explained by one of the most emphatic institutional statements ever made by Protestants in the history of Protestantism about theological education. And uh, as we're sitting here, you know at least enough of the history to know that for a while it was lost, and it might have been permanently lost. But at least in our context, there was a, there was a mechanism for it to be regained. And I'll just tell you, I look not so much at this room. I do like the room. I look at you and I say, if you want to see the power of an institution, just ask yourself, how would all of you ever be in one place at one time, even for a conversation like this, except for this institution existing as it exists right now? Now, the pre-political institutions, far more important. Uh, the biblically creation ordered institution is far more important. This institution, for example, is only a servant, but what an exhilarating uh, mission and stewardship uh, we have the honor of serving. Dr. George? Well, the importance of institutions is something that uh, historically, at least in modern history, uh, the left has understood much better than the conservative side has. Uh, they fought for the institutions and they won them. 
they planned a long march through the institutions. And um, they succeeded in marching through the institutions. So if you look at the main institutions that shape culture, and culture shapes consciousness, understanding, people's beliefs, conduct, you know, culture shapes people, general culture shapes people's beliefs taken as a whole, people as a whole, for example, in the United States, more than even their religious institutions just considered in isolation from the rest of culture do. That's why you can have, you know, Catholics like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, you know, s promoting abortion and same-sex relationships and, you know, all, all, all this stuff. I mean, it's clearly contrary to Christian teaching, clearly contrary to the teaching of the Catholic Church. But they'll, nevertheless, not only subscribe to those beliefs, but, but push them. Well, where did they get them? They obviously didn't get them from their church. They picked them up from the culture of which they are part of. So culture shapes consciousness, shapes understanding, shapes people's uh, beliefs. Folks on the left figured that out. The, 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 the modern, great modern Marxist Antonio Gramsci, for example, when he, when he saw that Marxism wasn't actually working the way Marx thought it would work, by an economic dynamic, uh, saw the importance of culture, and he produces a new form of Marxism, sometimes called cultural uh, uh, Marxism, that really does put the emphasis on working within the institutions to get control of the institutions and use them for uh, uh, left-wing collectivist uh, ends. Uh, he admired, he, he hated the Catholic Church, which of course all Marxists must, but he admired the church, and a lot of what he did was to uh, try to recreate the Marxist version of Catholic institutions. Um, little did uh, he know at the time that his successors would even manage to take over some Catholic uh, institutions, institutions today, that, including universities that claim to be Catholic, but uh, really overwhelmingly dominated by, by people that uh, Cramsey would find very congenial. Uh, to their to their views, so the left understands the importance of culture. They fought for them. They won them. If you look at the great institutions of uh, society today, uh, they're woke. Um, the universities, obviously, uh, the entertainment media, the news media, the great philanthropies, the great institutions such as mu of culture, such as museums, uh, the business corporations. You know, woke, woke capital is, is now virtually every major, is a good description of virtually every major American corporation and plenty that wouldn't, you know, be on the list of fortune, or the fortune list of, of, uh, of 500. And it's too, those of us who are conservative have nobody but ourselves to blame for letting the left take control of those institutions, to march through those institutions. So I think we need, much of what I've learned about institution building, I've just learned from the left, yeah is we need the, our own march through the institutions to take back these uh, institutions. Uh, but to There's an inequity there, though. Yeah. Excuse Go me. I, I'm agreeing with you. And so the way I put it was that uh, conservatives found institutions and then lose interest in them. And liberals gain interest in them and take them over. Um, you know, I think it was Rudy Deutschke who, who said yeah. the long march through the institutions, a German Marxist. And I, you know, I get in trouble with many on the left because I think cultural Marxism is exactly the right term to use. I use it without apology. Um, and, and woke is another way of putting it, but woke's the product of cultural Marxism. It, 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 and, it, and it just shows you again that things become emotional and attitudinal among people for whom they're not even cognitive uh, issues. But the problem with conservatives regaining institutions, and I'm going to say this after three decades here, and another decade in institutional life prior. Um, conservatives actually believe in, for instance, raising children and building neighborhoods and being involved in church in ways that liberals are unencumbered by. And so one of the things that I, I keep watching, and Dr. George, I'll just simply say this, is that I, I, w I am just, the older I get, losing confidence in any strategy to take over institutions that are now, in, in terms of their funding, their governance, and all the rest, are just completely controlled by the woke who are afraid of the more woke. And 
I, I, it's just, it's just very difficult. So the, I, 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 I'm not arguing. I think, I think it just, it's a very Augustinian insight. I'm afraid. It's just that we lose everything except for the things we are determined absolutely not to lose. And respond to that courage, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've still got courage. I think, it, I think it's the courage. It's the courage to look at the world and say, I am not going to pay your entry fee to be a part of this institution, a part of your circle. I, I am going to oppose you with every fiber of my being, but I will lose Harvard not to lose my family. Oh, sure. And and the left increasingly doesn't have that worry, which is one of the reasons why even demographically you're looking at a completely different reality. All right, I want to talk about the state of the evangelical mind. And it might sound odd that we have a Roman Catholic that I'm asking this to, but you said something in October when we were at the EPPC event and Carl Truman was sitting with us. And you said, verbatim, because I, I, I tucked oh. it away, you said that the state of the evangelical mind seems, from your vantage point as an outsider, as strong as it's ever been. And the context of this question is, as long as I have been in evangelicalism and paying, atten paying attention to intellectual currents, Mark Knoll's book of The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, that there is no evangelical mind in our constant infer infer inferiority complex, that we're always trying to play catch up, seems to loom very large, and yet you said this statement that was like, wait, we actually might be accomplishing something? So I'm just curious, what made you make that statement that you think things, on the at, le at least from the outsider's perspective, look somewhat healthy? Well, well, my heavens, it's the quality of the work being produced by evangelical intellectuals. It's just that straightforward. Okay. Uh, I'll embarrass you by saying your work, Andrew. Al's work, uh, John Wilsey's work, uh, my former student Michael Watson at Calvin College, his work, Carl Truman's fantastic work. Uh, I, I look out there and uh, uh, Daryl Charles, uh, the 18 authors. Uh, so so what, what, what the occasion for our gathering is, is this wonderful book of, of essays of Protestant scholars engaging my own work, 18 scholars that Andrew uh, brought together to do it. And, you know, I've had a lot of engagement with my work from people, from, you know, Catholics and secular liberals. And over the years, I've had a lot of engagement with my work. Uh, there's nothing that I've seen as impressive as these 18 essays. These guys bothered to actually understand what I said, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not being misrepresented. They, some, some disagree with some aspects of my work, which is fine. Uh, I'm probably wrong about some things. I need to be corrected. But the, the thing that is marvelous to me is that they accurately represent what I say. I'm so accustomed to my work being misunderstood or misrepresented even by people who do understand because they don't like my conclusions, right? They don't like the defense of the sanctity of human life in all stages and conditions or marriage is the conjugal union of husband and wife or religious freedom and the rights of conscience. And so they distort what I say in order to make a, a critique a lot easier for themselves. None of that goes on in this book. So here are 18 scholars, and they are not the only 18 in evangelicalism for whom this could be said, who you know, have just done this superb, well, as good as anything I see coming out of you know, Stanford or Yale or from the you know, more famous secular liberal or secular progressive uh, scholars. Not that there aren't many wonderful, very accomplished secular progressive scholars. They're not better than what evangelical Protestantism is producing today. Now, I, I don't know the history. There may have been a time when Mark Knoll was writing where you couldn't say that. Uh, but if there was a time, I, I hope that Professor Knoll would now look at the kind of work that you find in that book, for example, and say, well, you know what? They must have heeded what I said, because now we're getting first-class work out of our, especially young. M most of the writers in that book, not all, but most of them were were your generous, were younger scholars. Hey, I like the look of that for the future. If I'm, if I'm Al Mohler, I'm taking a lot of pride in that, and I'm being pretty optimistic. Dr. Mohler, response to that? Yeah, well, I want to tell you one of the best things about Robbie George is that he's a Roman Catholic who doesn't hate Catholics. Okay? <laughs> well, I'm a Southern Baptist who loves Southern Baptists. I'm an evangelical who loves actual evangelicals. An awful lot of the critique coming from even, I'll, I'll say, the book, The Scandal, The Evangelical Mind, is that there appears to be an antipathy towards popular uh, people. And so, for instance, I mean, at the popular level, populists, 
And so, for example, I didn't even think about this delicious moment. Uh, your book is published by the same publisher as Frank Peretti. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that was Mark Knoll's example of the emptiness of the evangelical mind. That's fascinating. Was the Frank Peretti novels, you know, This Present Darkness and other things, which he said just is so intellectually, you know, uh, discredited, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet that's the bestseller. And mentioned Tim LaHaye's, you know, I've forgotten the name of the series now, Left Behind, I think, you know, the, the whole thing. Well, I just put it this way. Um, I, I'm not fans of them. Uh, I am, that's, not, that's not where I spend my time. But I'll tell you what, if I get on an airplane and I see someone reading a Tim LaHaye book or a, a Frank Peretti novel, I have much more confidence they're going to share the gospel with someone sitting next to them. Uh, than someone sitting down with the New York Review of Books. And uh, and I will tell you that conservative recovery in the evangelical world has only come as a pincher maneuver. It has only come with conservative evangelical intellectuals. And it has only come with conservative grassroots believers who are willing to sacrifice to maintain, to sustain, and to recover. So I want to say, yeah, if you look at just evangelical, you know, I was president of the Evangelical Theological Society. You look at the, even the number of persons involved in that academic society. It's been a multiplication. Uh, now, there are risks with that. But it isn't an intellectual production. Let me speak in Marxist terms. Just in terms of intellectual production, massively more intellectual production. But what I'm warning against more than anything else is the cynicism that says, if you aren't like me, then you are an unwashed horde. And I want to say, look, we're only here because of believers in the pews, in the churches, who give sacrificially and pray for us and nurture Christians. And uh, and I don't really, I, my my realized eschatology here, and, and don't, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, understand that, I'm a pre-millennialist, but I am not aiming for the average believer coming to church ready to talk about the 80 pages of Luther or Aquinas or Calvin or Warfield that he read the previous week. We're looking for someone faithful to his wife, raising his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And yes, we want them to learn more, especially by the exposition of the Word of God. But let's face it, knowledge production is an elite privilege paid for by people who might not even understand or sympathize with it, but they do believe it's needed. And uh, so I just want to say that w one of the things that I would respond, Andrew, to you is that that book offended me so much when it was written, not because everything in it is untrue, because many of the criticisms are true, but because it was really written from looking at evangelicalism as a movement. I don't think evangelicalism is a movement. I think the church is the church. Mm. It's made up of real life human beings, and some of them are crying in the nursery. Um, so knowledge production is really important. I think this institution clearly stands for that. But knowledge production is a privilege. Mm. Discipleship is a mandate. Andrew, as you know, uh, I run a big program at Princeton, the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. You kindly mentioned that in the introduction for my lecture. And among the things we do is we have a very active and large uh, program of visiting scholars and postdoctoral fellows. I, I, I believe we have something like 16 or 17 at the, at the moment this year. And year in and year out, we have a large number. Now, uh, my policy is that we choose our visiting fellows and our, and our postdoctoral fellows on the merits. That is, on the basis of intellectual achievement and intellectual promise. It's what we do. We don't have quotas for this many Catholics and this many this and this many that. Um, we choose on the merits. And on the merits, we have had many evangelical Protestant scholars as fellows of the Madison program, both at the visiting scholar level, which is more senior, and at the post-doctoral, including Dr. Wilsey from, uh, from, from, from here. Now, I want to know why the Madison program is unusual in elite academia in having such a high representation of evangelical Christian scholars. 
I know it's not because I'm putting a thumb. They're my beloved brothers and I love them, but I'm not giving them special, special standing. They're getting there on the merits. But if they're getting there on the merits in the Madison program, and we don't have some similar sort of representation across Harvard and Yale and Stanford and the University of Chicago and Duke and so forth, I'm tempted to think there must be something else going on. A certain prejudice and discrimination against evangelicals by the cognitive or intellectual elite, what Irving Crystal shocking. called the knowledge class. Yeah, they're shocking. shocking. Gambling in Casablanca, right? You see gambling right. in Casablanca. We, well, I, if I could just say, I, I appreciate Dr. George's candor on that. And Robbie's, Robbie's in a position to speak of this, uh, obviously from the social context and the intellectual context of Princeton. Um, I, I think a part of the problem in the larger academy is it's not always, and this is what's amazing, because you have these studies that come out, George Yancey and others have done these, where, and, and, and frankly, the left has done them, where, where you have people who identify and you know that, you just look at voting patterns. You look at and and what is available even more quickly is uh, political donations. And you know, if you look at the most elite educational institutions. Let's just say Republicans would starve, and uh, and Democrats flourish. And that's an understatement. But I think a lot of this is the replication factor, and, and that is that uh, you, you like calls to like, and uh, the two things that Dr. George I just think are massive impediments. Robbie, first of all, many of these things have an entrance requirement that requires you to forfeit the faith. Uh, many of these academic programs. I had a student applying for a graduate program at a prestigious university who showed me some of the materials sent to prospective PhD students. And I mean, the DEI woke stuff is oh, so yeah. thick. I see, I see what you mean. You're going to have to sell your soul to sign on to this. And uh, then the other thing I would say is a young assistant professor at another one of these elite universities who is never going to be anything but an assistant professor which means he's on the way out. And it was the evaluation form uh, for even tenure review. He didn't qualify ideologically for the application for tenure because of what you had to sign on to. So all that to say, I, I think where, so I'm, I'm responding to Dr. George and Robbie saying, why aren't there more things? Well, well, first of all, there aren't more Robbie Georges. I mean, it takes, human agency turns out to be really important. And human agency with courage turns out to be doubly important. And it just so happens that that's Robbie George. Uh, but none of those things would be happening at Princeton right now, but for him. And uh, so we just need to pray that there will be more with courage and uh, an access and ability to at least put a foot in the door slamming in our face so that we can get a few more in while it is day. All right, we are almost out of time. <clears throat> Real quick, brief question to conclude our time together. We heard that. We heard all three words. Where is, <laughs> where, it, where is an area of hope that you see in the world around you? I want to end on, an, on a hopeful note, not just an optimistic note, as Robbie taught us. Where do you see something that gives you actual hope in the world around you? I was hoping to have the last word here, simply <laughs> because I had to think for a minute. Um, yeah. So, I, I, you know, there's a little interest and in, in, uh, so some good questioning on uh, Thomas and inclination and Dr. George's lecture. And uh, uh, that'd be a great conversation to continue, by the way. I want to speak of something else that's similar, and that is attraction. And so the greatest hope I have is what I see Christ doing in his church and in producing a generation of young, courageous Christians and young, courageous married, Christian marriages and Christian families. So that's first. But the second thing is I detect at this stage in my life something more powerfully than I did earlier, and that is the attractiveness of truth. I see more people in unexpected contexts who want to tell me, I heard something you said here. I wish you would explain that further, or I've never heard that before. Or you make an affirmation about human dignity and people start nodding their heads and you realize you don't know what you're agreeing to here yet. <laughs> uh, but I, so I, I, th I, I have a Christian theological explanation for that, uh, also rooted in creation and most importantly in Imago Dei. So, I'll answer your question. You said short. It is, I want to get to hopefulness 
in the attractiveness and the beauty of truth, which is compelling. Dr. George? Well, this one is sort of an easy one for me. Um, I think if we're going to change things, especially institutionally, if we're going to march back through the institutions, which I think we should do, we need people, young people, people of your generation, who are brilliant, because it takes a lot of it takes a lot of smarts to navigate these waters. They're shark infested. We need people who are brilliant. We need people who are dedicated. They really believe in the cause. People of deep faith, for example. We need people who are adept. You can be brilliant, but not adept. We need people who are adept. And we need people who are courageous. Because, man, it's rough. This is hard work. This is rough work. You need a thick skin. They're going to be coming after you. They're going to try to cancel you. They're going to try to undercut you in every way, destroy your repu reputation. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that, man, finding people with any one or even or, or, or and certainly two of those qualities is hard enough, but how do you find people with four? Then I start thinking, and I start thinking, and, and these names may not be familiar to all of you, but Alan, Alan uh, uh, Dr. Walker, Andrew will, will recognize him. I start thinking, and I think, Sharif Girgis, Ryan Anderson, Melissa Muscala, uh, Gabrielle uh, Girgis, uh, Ramesh uh, Panuru, and I start going on and on, Anna Samuel, April Redlinger, on and on, young men and women who are brilliant, dedicated, unmovable, like the Rock of Gibraltar, adept, they know how to do it, how to operate and willing to take the slings and arrows, stand up there in the heat of the battle, right in the line of fire, and speak their minds. Man, that inspires me. With that keeps me going. It, it, it makes me think, yeah, I need to be, keep doing what I'm, what I'm doing. And I'll add to that list Andrew Walker. Amen. That's very hopeful. Thank you. Um, would you join me in uh, thanking Dr. George and Dr. Moeller for their time? Thank you.